Good morning. Happy Easter. You all ready to worship? Let's worship him this morning. Alone in my sorrow, dead in my sin, lost without hope. rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose in our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over your endless love pouring out on us. You have made a new so I begins with you. Oh, we're free, free, for never we're free. Now come join the song of all the Did my life begin? Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free, forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began. When death was arrested and my life began. Yes, when death was arrested, my life began. singing everybody you can be seated welcome to Northwoods Church we are glad that you're here this morning you should have received a bulletin on your way in we just encourage everyone to look inside find that connect card that is inside there we invite folks to uh, fill that out it becomes a way for you to communicate with us let us know if we can pray for you or serve you in any way 
and it'll also be used later in the service, and so be great if you had that filled out. We have a couple of things we want to draw your attention to uh, very quickly that are in the bulletin, but we're going to encourage you to read it because we have uh, full service this morning. We're just going to talk about a couple of those things. One is that we have a Northwoods class coming up very soon. Uh, the, our Northwoods class is how we uh, talk about where our church has been, where it's going, and how you can be a part of it. And uh, we'd love for you to be a part of it. If you've been coming to Northwoods for a little while, or if uh, you're just brand new here, this is a way to get connected at our church. And if you sign up there, it's coming up May 19th after the 1045 service. And uh, we'd love for you to be a part of that. Also, we have family equipping seminars coming up. There's a couple, but the one that uh, is most pressing is um, on busyness and dealing with the ba uh, balancing the pressures of life. And so uh, it's coming up May 5th. Uh, during the 1045 service in the student center. And uh, we want to be a service to parents, and uh, if that will be a benefit to you, then uh, sign up, please. There are also uh, other announcements in the bulletin for students, for adults, for men and women, and you can see those there. Um, and uh, feel free to sign up for those things that are relevant to you. We are, we are so glad that you're celebrating Easter at Northwoods, and we want to worship the Lord who is risen. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful that you died the death that we deserve because of our sin. And Lord, I pray that today we would celebrate that. We would sing from full hearts that we would recognize what a monumental thing it is that you, the Lord of the universe, would give your life on a cross for us. We are grateful we celebrate it this morning. And Father, I pray that you would bless our day together. Help us to honor you. Remember your resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand together? Let's continue to worship the Lord. go sing it out your name.
and shackles of all of my failures and wondering how long is this gonna last then you look at this prisoner and say to me son stop fighting a fight that's already been won set me free so I'll shake off these heavy chains and wipe away every stain I'm not who I used to be I am redeemed and all my life I been called unworthy name by the voice of my shame and regret but when I hear you whisper child lift up your head you remember oh God I am redeemed Cause you set me free So I'll shake all these heavy chains And wipe away every stain I'm not who I used to be Because I don't have to be The old man inside of me Cause his day is long dead and gone the same and a hope that will carry me home I am redeemed you said me free so I'll shake off these heavy chains and wipe away every stain I'm not who I used to be Shake off these heavy chains and wipe away every stain. I'm not who I used to be. Oh God, I'm not who I used to be. Jesus, I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. Amen. Maybe you see. see that. Thank God, redeem. You have your Bibles this morning. Would you take them and turn with me to the book of Job? The book of Job, chapter 1. And yes, as I uh, say the book of Job, I do know it's Easter. But we'll, we'll have an unusual Easter sermon, probably the most unusual Easter text I've ever preached to get to the resurrection, but we'll have fun. At least I will. Uh, some, some years ago, I preached a, or read a, I was in college, and I, I read a quote from Joseph Parker, who is a, a British preacher from the 1800s, and he said, if, if you'll always preach to hurting people, your pews won't be empty. And that's, I found that to be true. If you preach to pain, it has an impact on your church. Um, there's hope in the middle of our pain. And to today, the way we're going to get to the resurrection is we're going to talk about pain. Job was one of the first books written, uh, if you looked at it chronologically, and he's a contemporary of Abraham. Job did not have uh, 39 books in the Old Testament in his hand. He didn't have 
five books of the Old Testament in his hand. He didn't have the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy in his hand. He, he had no written law in his hand. All Job had was oral tradition that a Messiah would come. That's all he knew. And for those of you who know the story of Job, this is a story of great difficulty, a story of great pain. For those of you who don't know the story of Job, we're about to see it. And so there's really three things that we're going to see today. The first is Job's pain. You'll notice in Job chapter 1, look in verse 1 if you have your Bibles. If you don't, it'll be on the screen. Verse 1 says this, there was a man in the land of Uz. Wouldn't you like to be from the land of Uz? It does not say the land of Oz. It says the land of Uz. The last church that I pastored in Greencastle, Indiana, that had a young man whose name was Buzz. That was his God-given name. Somebody named him Buzz. Wouldn't you like to be Buzz from Uz? <laughs> there was a man in the land of Buzz, no, land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was, watch some of these descriptions. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Wouldn't you like for that to be said about you? There was a man in the land of Evansville whose name was Bobby, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Drop the mic and walk away. I mean, that, that would be, if that could just be said about any of us. This was a, this was a good man. That's what verse 1 is saying. Job is a good man. He, blameless, upright, feared God, turned away from evil. He was a man of integrity. Look at verse 2 and 3. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. He had a good life. He was a good man. He had a good life. If you count it up, he had 11,000 mouths to feed. So one of the things I would say to you for those, when, when people have, have means or people have wealth, people who have wealth have a lot of responsibility. This man has been greatly blessed, but with being greatly blessed, he had a lot of things to do. He had 11,000 mouths to feed, according to verse Three, and then you find that he was the greatest of all the people of the East. This man would have been on the color of, cover of Forbes. He would have been traded on Wall Street, but he would not, we would not be right to call him filthy rich. We would be right to call him clean rich. That's, the, that's a more accurate description here. He is not coming about his means wrong. Verse 4. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. So there are seven sons. They would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. They had a good relationship with their sisters and invite them over for the party. Verse 5, when the day of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. That's ten. For Job said, it may be, that maybe, it may be, it may be, it may be. I was not a stutter. It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. So he's not saying that, okay, my kids are out and they're boozing it up. They're, they're, they're partying too hard. I know they're wrong. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I don't know what they're doing, and they may have done something wrong in their heart. And because they may have done something wrong in their heart, I'm going to offer burnt offerings. They didn't have priests during this time. This is pre-law. And so he, as a father, goes on their behalf, and he loves his kids. Notice the last phrase. Thus Job did continually. He's always thinking on behalf of his family. So he's a good man with a good life, and he's, he does good. This is a good guy. And then in chapter 1, verse number Six, the heaven unveil, and we see Satan having a conversation with God. 
In verse 8, God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? He's a blameless man. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be cool if God said to Satan about us, look at Bobby, he's, pretty good. he's a good man. He's a good man. He's a good man. Because if God says that he's a, he's a, pretty good, he's a good guy, God's, God's telling, God's a truth teller. And we know that God allows Satan at Job. And all of the things of life begin to go away in Job's life. Notice the ending of that. Look in chapter 1, verse 18. All of his stuff has faded away. But look at chapter 1, verse 18. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness, came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Now, let's pause. His ten children just died. Don't read past that. He's lost everything else previous to this. He's lost, so he had 11,000 mouths to feed. Now he's lost his 10 children. He's got one person left. That's his wife. We'll talk about her in a few minutes. 10 children dead. I've never experienced that. I've never experienced the death of a child. Ten, gone. Verse 20, what's Job's response? Job arose, tore his robe. Jewish custom, this is a way of grief. Shaved his head, another way of grief. Fell on the ground and worshipped. My mind is blown. And this is what he says. Naked, I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And if there's a verse to underline in chapter 1, it's the last verse. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. So I've never had the death of children. But what I will say is, is that I have had pain. And in my pain, have I ever sinned? Yes. Here's what I'll tell you about this room. Pain is relative and it is unavoidable. So in this room, when I say pain is relative, what, what feels like a 10 to one person would be a 5 or 6 to another person. But pain is relative. And it's unavoidable. Every person in this room will experience pain. You have experienced it, and I have bad news you're about to. Happy Easter. What's the, what's the Easter message here? I, we're, I'm coming. It, it's coming. But let's begin with pain. Pain is relative, and it is unavoidable. And in all of this, Job did not sin. Look in Job chapter 2, verse 7. God, once again, there's an unveiling of heaven. Satan is allowed to get after Job, and this time at his body. Chapter 2, verse 7. Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, and he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. His wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity, curse God, and die? Now, a lot of people right here say bad things about Job's wife. Let me say to you, I'm not going to say anything bad about Job's wife because I want you to think about this. She's just lost 10 kids. When you lose 10 children, you're going to say stuff. You have, you have great potential, I should say, to say things of crossing a line that you shouldn't cross, you've just, she just lost 10 children, 10, cho 10 children, 10 children, and she tells her husband off, 
I'm shocked. There are husbands in here who've told their wives off. There are wives in here. Matter of fact, there's not a husband in here or a wife in here who hasn't told their wife or husband off. You know? And th- th- that was unnecessary, but thank you. <laughs> and, 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 and what I need you to know in that process is this. What I need you to know is, what I, what I, I need you to know is that didn't happen in the process of losing 10 children. We cross those lines way early. Pain is relative. It is unavoidable. Look at the response in verse 10. He said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and not receive evil? Another line to underline. And all this Job did not sin with his lips. Once again, my mind kapow. Now look in Job 3, look in verse 3. Let the day perish, now we're seeing his heart. Here's Job's heart, unveiled. Let the day perish which I was born, the night that said a man is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. You know what he's saying? I wish the day that I was born, I wish it would have never happened. I wish, I wish I would have never been born. I've been, I'm in so much pain. Look in chapter 3, verse 24. For my sighing comes instead of my bread. My groanings are poured out like water. For the thing that I feared comes upon me. What I dread befalls me. I'm not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. I'm in so much pain, I can't sleep. Look, look you have emotions And when you're in great pain, God's aware of your emotion. He's not shocked. Tell him. You think God's afraid of us? Well, if I were really honest with God, he would be very angry with me. Just just let, let her loose. God can handle you. Be honest with the Lord. Job does this. You see his pain. Then we move from Job's pain to his friends. Go back in chapter 2, verse 7. Excuse me, chapter 2, verse 11. I apologize. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite. They made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. These friends, this is the best thing they do in the entire book. They sat with Job for seven days and said nothing. They simply gave their presence. And by the way, we can learn something from this. When people are in pain our, and they're our friends, sometimes the very best thing we can do is just show up and shut up. By the way, in three services today, that's the first time I've said that. Just, just show up and shut up. Just show up and be quiet. And just hang out. Be friends. Reveal ourselves. Be nice. Notice Job reveals himself in chapter 3. Watch what Eliphaz says. Look in Job chapter 4, verse 1. When Eliphaz finally speaks, notice what he says. Eliphaz the Temanite answered and he said, If one ventures a word with you, will you be impatient? Now he's been quiet for seven days. Yet, who can keep from speaking? Behold, you have instructed many, and you have strengthened the weak hands. Your words have upheld him who was stumbling. You have made firm the feeble needs. So far, he's done good. But now it has come to you, and you are impatient. It touches you, and you are dismayed. Is not your fear of God your confidence? Is the integrity of your ways your hope? 
Remember who that was innocent ever perished. Or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger they are consumed. So what's Eliphaz saying? Here's Eliphaz's point. Job, you've sinned. You've done something to deserve this. I don't know what you did, but you're nowhere near as good in private as what you've shown yourself in public. I mean, in private, you're doing something. What a friend. Well, but he's got three, so it's got to get better, right? Go to Job 8. Some of you are nervous. It's like, are you going to preach the whole book? No, I'm not going to preach the whole book. We're going to get out and have lunch. This is my third sermon. I can't wait to quit. I'm sorry, I just lost (laughs) self-control. All right, you ready? Job 8, verse 1. Some of y'all, that's that's why we came to the third service. We figured you'd be this way. Verse 1. Here we go. Bildad, Bildad the Shuhad answered and said, How long will you say these things? And the words of your mouth be a great win. Does God pervert justice or does the Almighty pervert the right? If your children have sinned against him, he's delivered them into the hands of their transgression. Eliphaz says, you've sinned. Bildad said, I don't think you're the sinner. It's your kids. Just sort of want to slap Eliphaz. I want to kill this guy. I mean, think about it. You can say what you want to say about me. Don't say anything about my kids. You mess with my kids? I mean, some of y'all already say stuff about me. Leave my kids alone. They're off, but you don't touch them. They're my kids. Look at Job 11. We've got to find a good friend. How about Zophar, verse 1? Then Zophar the Namathite answered and said, Should a multitude of words go answer, and a man full of talk be judged right? Should your babble silence men, and when you mock shall no one shame you? For you say, My doctrine is pure, and I am clean in God's eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you, and that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom. He is manifold in understanding. Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. Notice, Zophar says in verse 2, you have a multitude of words, you're full of talk, you have babble. Zophar says, hey, tell me, let me tell you the problem with you, Job, you talk too much. Here's what I hear from you, Job, wah, 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 wah. You just need to hush. Get back in your little pile of dust, keep shaving your head, and hush. That's not a friend. Look in Job 13. There are two chapters that I think describe the lowest parts of Job's life. This is one of them. Job here in chapter 13 defends himself. Watch what he says in these first nine verses. Behold, my eye has seen all this. My ear has heard and understood it. What you know, I know. I'm not inferior to you guys. I would speak to the Almighty. I desire to argue my case with God. As for you guys, you whitewashed with lies. You are worthless physicians, all of you. Oh, that you guys would keep silent. That was your best days. It would, and that would be your wisdom. Hear now my argument and listen to the pleading of my lips. Will you speak falsely for God and to speak deceitfully for him? Will you show partiality toward him? Will you plead the case for God? Will it be well with you when he searches you out, when you're in pain? Or can you deceive him as one deceives a man? Guys, do you want to be in my situation? And yet in the middle of all this, I find it interesting that Job never fully gives up on his friends. Later, he'll say in the book of Job, chapter 17, he'll say, you, friends, come on again, all of you. Tell me more information. Tell me more. 
I'm not going to find anything wise from you, but try. Why? Because he knew the truth. It's found in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Refuses are the kisses of an enemy. Real friends will tell you the truth. Job's friends were not helpful. And yet somehow or another, Job finds hope. Here's the last point of the sermon. Let me show you this hope. In Job 13, look in verse 15. Here's verse 15. Job says this. This is in the middle of the great pain of all all the things that have happened in the middle of all of his friends. He says this. Though he slays me, I will hope in him. Even if the Lord kills me, even if God kills me, my hope won't change. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you felt like possibly what you were going through would be the end of you. But oftentimes what I have found is that Trouble comes, and when trouble comes, trouble so many times will either push us towards God or away from Him. And when trouble comes, you have to decide on the front end, am I going to allow this to take away my hope, or am I going to allow the trouble that comes solidify my hope? He says, though He slays me, I am still going to put my hope in him. Charles Spurgeon was one of the great preachers of the last century. He struggled with depression. And when he he struggled with depression, a man walked up to him and said, so what does it feel like when you are struggling in the deepest throes of your depression? His response was this. He said, it feels like being in a dungeon underneath a castle of despair. Have you ever felt like... It doesn't have to be about depression. Have you ever felt like you were in a dungeon underneath a castle of despair? That there was no hope? Job Job says, "He he may slay me, but my hope's not going to change. And he takes, a, he takes a, a rope that he's hanging on, and it's like he ties a knot in it, and he says, I'm going I'm to hang on right here. No matter what happens, I'm going to hang on to this Not that I'm going to hang on to him. And there's one last chapter. Look in Job 19. And I think this is the other chapter that has the worst picture of pain in the other and and all the rest of the book. And it says this, starting in verse 1. It says, Job answered and he said, how long were you going to torment me and break me in pieces with words? These ten times, guys, you cast reproach upon me. Are you not ashamed to wrong me? And even if it be true that I've erred, my error remains in myself. If indeed you magnify yourselves against me and make my disgrace an argument against me, know then that God has put me in the wrong and he's closed his net about me. Behold, I cry out violence, but I am not answered. I call for help, but there is no justice. He has walled up my way so that I cannot pass, and he has set darkness upon my path. He stripped from me my glory. He's taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side. I'm gone. My hope has he pulled up like a tree. He's kindled his wrath against me. He counts me as his adversary. His troops come on together. They cast up their siege ramp against me and they camp around my tent. He's put my brothers far from me. Those who know me are wholly estranged from me. My relatives failed me. My close friends forgot me. The guests in my house, my maidservants, they count me like a stranger. I become a foreigner in their eyes. I call to my servant. He gives me no answer. I must plead with him with my mouth for mercy. Verse 17 is awesome. My breath is strange to my wife. I'm a stench to the children of my own mother. Even young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. All my intimate, close friends, they abhor me. And those whom I love have turned against me. My bones stick to my skin and to my flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. You can't get lower than this. 
everybody is away from me. It's Job saying, he's saying, I want to be heard. I want somebody to listen to me, and none of you will listen to me. My friends are gone. My wife's gone. My relatives are gone. Nobody will listen to me. And I'm reminded in Psalm 116, it says this. Psalm 116, it says, I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my pleas for mercy because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I call on him as long as I live. And he's, he's going to tie one more knot. That knot, before I show it to you in the passage, some years ago, this, the truth from this passage was put in song. Uh, Nicole Mullins is the one who made it famous. and Linda's going to sing this song, and then I'll, I'll preach the rest of it. I appreciate her singing this this morning. Who taught the sun? Where to stand in the morning And who told the ocean You can only come this far And who showed the moon Where to hide till evening Whose words alone can catch a falling well, I know my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer lives. All of creation testifies this life within me. That spins things in orbit. He runs to the weary, the worn and the weak. And the same gentle hands that hold me when I'm broken, they conquer dead to bring me victory. Verse 23 says this, Oh, that my words were written, they were. 
Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. They were. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. They were. For I know this, that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, after, it's, after my skin's been eaten by worms in my flesh, I'll see God. What's Job saying? Job is saying he knows that he has a redeemer, and that redeemer changes everything. Notice some facts in verse 25. He is saying that he doesn't have a, he doesn't have a Bible. He doesn't, he doesn't own one. He doesn't have five, he didn't have the Old Testament law. All he has is oral tradition. It's been passed down from generation to generation. All, that's all he's got. We have, we have the Pentateuch, we have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament. We, we, have, we, have, we can look back and see proof of Jesus' life, the virgin birth, a sinless life the crucifixion, the empty tomb, seen by many witnesses after the resurrection, we get all that, and here is a man 1,000, 1,500 years before his life, the life of Jesus, and he says, I know this, my Redeemer lives, fact one, and then fact two, one day that same Redeemer will stand on this earth, and he was right. He was right. My hope is the same hope he has. My faith is the same hope he has. It's just that I have more facts to put it on. So do you. And the very term redeemer means that he paid for something. He gave his self to pay for something. What did he pay for? Me. He paid for my sins. He paid for your sins so that there can be something that happens That thing that happens, one of the things that happens is found in verse 26. So that one of these days I will see God. So that this life is not all about, uh, it's not about, it's not about divorce. It's not about funerals. It's not about pain and cancer. Seizures. not about deaconess or St. Vincent's. So many of you in this room say amen on so many levels. It's not about cemeteries, funeral homes. We put our hope in Jesus because there comes a day that there's no more pain. There comes a day that everything will be made right because we will be in his presence. That's the wonderful news. You say, well, well that, won't that be true for all of us? That everything will be made right for all of us for all time. No, it won't be. See, there's us. Beautiful picture. And we are all Sinners. We are broken in our relationship with God. We are not in a relationship with God. We we can't fix this. Sometimes we try to fix this because we try to be good, go to church, get baptized, join a church, be moral. And all of these things fall short. God cannot ignore our sin because he's holy, yet he loves us and wants to be in a relationship with us. So what has God done? He sent his own son to redeem us, to pay for our sins. And so now I have a choice. Am I going to try to span the gap? Or will I by faith receive the gift he has paid for and given on the cross? And the cross has become, if you would, a bridge. That by faith, I can receive the gift of salvation. And I can now be in a relationship with God. You can have that. 
You can turn from your sin. You can repent of your sin, receive forgiveness of your sin, and commit your life to Christ. And I'll say to you, there's no other way. There's, that's all we've got, but that's enough. That's our hope. Why do we meet together on Easter? Because he's alive and it's been known that he would come and give his life and rise again for 1,500 years before he ever came. What a wonderful truth. If you'll grab your Connect card, I want you to look at something and then I'm going to close the message. You'll notice on the back of your Connect card, at the very top of it, it says this. Your spiritual sur survey, it says, A, I am already a committed follower of Jesus. I am already right here. I'm in a relationship with Christ. B is saying, I am over here. But I want to be here. I want to do that. I don't know how, but I want to put my faith in Jesus. I'd like to do that today. C is saying, I'm in a relationship with God. I remember the day that I repented of my sins. I remember the day that I committed my life to Christ. But I am over here. I am a long ways away from him. And I want to draw close to him. I want to recommit my life to Christ. And D, it's intentionally on there. It says, I don't want to make any decision this morning. If you mark B or C, you have a couple of choices if you mark that. One is if you put that in the offering plate, we'll call you, contact you, because we want to help you. We, we don't, we're not going to look at, at B or C and not make a phone call. So that's like your warning. Is that fair? You've just been warned. You mark B, you mark C, we're going to call. Let me also say this. Please mark B or C if that's the situation. Because we're not going to call and be mad. We're going to call and be happy. Okay? And we're not going to sell you Amway. Okay? It'll be okay. I've just offended every Amway person in the room. <laughs> I would also say that if you're in this room and you say, I, I'm, a, I'm B, I'm C, and I, I, I want to address this right now. In just a few moments, we're going to be done with the service. And back here in this corner and in this corner, there's a table. You can walk up to that table with your Connect card and say, I've marked B, I've marked C, and I'd like to talk to somebody. We'd rather, we'd like to, we have people who will be there. We'd like to address that right now with you. In 2010, there were Chilean miners who were trapped a half a mile below ground. There were a billion people watching the rescue on live TV. A billion people. The youngest of the miners, Jimmy Sanchez, sent a letter to the surface. Now, understand, there were 33 miners below the surface. The, Jimmy Sanchez sent a letter to the surface and he said, there are actually 34 of us as God has never left us. Jose Enriquez, half a mile below the surface, he said he became the pastor of the group. He wrote a book called The Miracle in the Mine. He said this in the book. He said, God did not need any doors to get into the middle of the mine where we were. Every time we called on his name, he came. He was there, and he was present. A week before the rescue, he kept showing, Jose Enriquez kept giving the gospel. And a week before they were rescued, 22 of the 34 miners came to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Some of you have walked in here today, and it's Easter, and you look good. Shoot, I've even got a tie on today. 
what I would want you to know is this. If you look good on the outside, but on the inside your pain is high, God does not need a door to enter your situation. He's already there. He knows. And if you ever wonder if he loves you, he proved it on a cross. And if you ever wonder, can he do something about it, he proved it. Tomb is empty. Trust him. I don't know what you're facing. He's not in the tomb. He's in the room. He's here. Surrender yourself to him. Would you bow your heads with me? I could have our ushers come. We're going to take the offering at this time, and you can put your Connect card in the offering plate. You can, those of you, this is your church, you can participate with the offering as you'd like. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. When the service is over, for those of you who'd like to come by the Next Steps table, we invite you to do that. I pray that you have a wonderful resurrection day. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for the opportunity you give us today to worship you, to recognize what you have done for us. Thank you. May we live lives that honor you. May we serve you. May we be faithful to you. Thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. Yeah, I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe. I believe in God our Father. Yes, 
Yes, I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe. They say